Hey, well, welcome everybody to the second monthly installment of the Riverside Astronomical Society's and the University of California Riverside's virtual star party. We happen to have, this is the second one we're doing through this monthly. And tonight we have a special edition, primarily a solar system edition. We're we'll showing you things through our telescope, mainly things close to home here in our solar system. Um, We'll be going to our chat room. You'll be able to chat with us and ask questions and make comments. And hopefully we'll be able to respond to everything that you say, all your questions. And we'll also learn a little bit about some of the constellations in the, in the night sky. So my name is John Lederbach Vega. I'm the director of the outreach program here at the Riverside Astronomical Society. Uh, normally we would be doing these kind of events on the backyard of a scout troop meeting or in a playground for an elementary school where we set up our telescopes and have people come and look directly into a telescope and directly see the photons from Saturn hitting them in the eyes. Uh, but given the state of the pandemic and the COVID, we're doing this virtually. So we have cameras attached to our telescopes and our cameras will be broadcasting onto your computer screen. Um, so I am not any kind of professional astronomer. I have no formal training in astronomy. Uh, I've just been hooked on the science ever since I was nine years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin got out and walked around on the moon. The most amazing thing ever. Um, and also uh, Sinan. Great, thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sinan Du, and I am actually in charge of public outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. My background is in astronomy, and specifically, I study galaxies that are really, really far away from the Milky Way. Um, I got my PhD in astronomy about two years ago, and I'm really excited and passionate about outreach. So I'm, I'm really passionate for sharing all the exciting science with, with you all tonight. It is a great pleasure to collaborate with the Riverside Astronomical Society, um, and now we have this monthly stargazing program. And uh, thank you, John. Do you want me to start to introduce the live chat room moderators? Oh, when are you going to talk about the evaluation process? Uh, well, I can I can talk about it now. So this is our second session of the the monthly program, and we're very excited to see many of you joining us again, and a lot of new newcomers. So we'd really appreciate uh, your feedback, and we would love to improve our program based on your needs and your preference. So please um, just take a minute to tell us how we did tonight, either good or bad. And uh, I will be actually sending you all uh, a survey link so that you could fill out. It's not gonna take more than three minutes and it's gonna be anonymous. So if you could uh, fill that out um, after the event, that would be much appreciated. Great. So uh, yeah, how about our chat room staff? Great. Um, so today we actually have multiple uh, lovely volunteers that are helping us uh, to moderate the, the chat room that you can see on the right hand side of uh, the, the window. So I will introduce them and they are mainly graduate students in astronomy and physics. So I will just introduce them based on uh, their order on my screen. So first we have uh, Garrett. Hello, everyone. And Frank Hill. Hi there, happy to be here. And Jess. Hello. Yingfeng. Hello. Yongda. Hi, everyone. And finally, we have Cheryl. Hello. Cheryl was also a science teacher. So all of them will be helping us to answer questions um, from you all. So we would um, welcome all kinds of questions and comments and encourage you to engage in discussions as well. Most of the questions will be answered by our volunteers and uh, the remainder will be answered by the panel. So I guess that's all from me, John. Awesome. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's go to the sky, look up at the sky. So here we are looking to the Northwest, high in the Northwest. We're looking for what we call the Big Dipper here in the United States. But in other areas of the world, it's called the plow, and there's probably other names as well. And here, 
we look at there's the handle of the Big Dipper, the bowl of the Big Dipper, and that is pretty easy to find. The stars are pretty bright. You find them even if you're living in a city. And um, the reason I bring up the Big Dipper, because if you go down to the bowl of the Big Dipper, and you look over to the, to the left part of your screen from that bowl, right about here, right inside that circle is where we will find the comet Neowise. Now, if, unless you've lived, been living in a hole in the ground, you've probably heard about the comet. It's been very much in the news all over the social media and such. And tonight we will show you a live image of the comet as it speeds away from Earth and the sun. So again, you find the Big Dipper in the Northwest sky you look to the left of the bowl, and there you will find the comet. If you're in a very dark place, you might be able to see it with the naked eye. Otherwise, you're gonna need a comet, uh, excuse me, binoculars. But anyway, I'll stop talking and let Manny take over. Manny take over. Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button on my, uh, on my uh, microphone there. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Manny Weiss. I am coming from, be from uh, beautiful Mariposa, California, uh, which is uh, about an hour west of Yosemite. And uh, I don't know if you can tell at all from the, the surroundings here, but I'm in my remote uh, observatory here. And I have, a, uh, I have a telescope and a camera trained on the comet. Um, so we have tonight a first quarter moon and from my location which is about uh three degrees north of where some of you folks are in southern california uh it's not quite dark yet and so uh, john went through his uh his introductions really fast uh it's 907 <laughs> and uh quite frankly we're still uh i'm watching as the subframes come in on the comet and uh the sky is gradually darkening and uh, I think in about 10 minutes, I should have a view. But right now, uh, I don't think I have anything that's, uh, that's too worthwhile showing. I don't know, John, if you want to try to do a little bit of a, of a tour there. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take there. the screen again, and we'll come back to you. OK. It's a Sounds little good. darker. All right, so we're going to go back up outside, look up at the stars. And this is what we see, right? And in this case, we're going to back away. And you see all these blue lines all over the screen. Those are the lines, imaginary lines, that connect the stars of a constellation. But you also see there is orange goes all the way across your screen from one side to the next. And that is the special line called the ecliptic. Now, our solar system is pretty much a flat disk. It's rotating around the sun. And this ecliptic is of us looking at the edge of that disk. And we'll show you all the planets, the moon, the sun, everything in the solar system follows somewhere along that line. For example, if you look over here on the far left side of your screen, I don't know how well you can make that out, but there's these two stars called Jupiter and Saturn, which are not stars at all. Um, the, if again, if you were able to go outside right now and look to the south, you would see a very bright star, which is Jupiter, brighter than anything in the sky tonight other than the moon, and then trailing behind to the left of, Sat of Jupiter is Saturn, which is much dimmer. And you notice how both of those stars are on that orange line. They are on the ecliptic. Now, let me zoom out a little bit so we can see a larger piece of the sky. And I'm going to go fast forward in time from basically 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And now when we look at here, we see, oops, let me zoom out a little bit. So if we look over here onto the far right side of your screen, that's where you now find Saturn and Jupiter. They've spent the night moving across from east to west. Now in the middle of your screen, high in the sky is the planet Mars. And way over here, ignore that line. <laughs> way over here, a far in the far left side of your screen is Venus that is just now rising into the sky. So the ecliptic 
is the line where the planets will all follow across the sky, which is why sometimes the planets line up. Like right now, Jupiter and Saturn are pretty much lined up with each other. Sometimes you'll see Venus in there with them, maybe Mars. And those are spectacular when you can see four or five planets all lined up together. Um, tonight, we just have Jupiter and Saturn lined up, Mars and Venus, they're spread out. Um, so if you wind up seeing a very bright star somewhere that is nowhere near the ecliptic, then you pretty much can be sure it's not a planet. If you do see something very bright right along the ecliptic, yeah, there's a good chance that is a planet. So knowing where the ecliptic is, and especially when you see a few planets, it's, it's easy to sketch out that line in the sky as you just connect the dots. Um, so the ecliptic is, is important. That's where we find some of the cool stuff in the sky, such as the planets. So Manny, how's it going up there now? Any different? Okay, we're getting we're getting better. I just changed uh, my exposure from uh, from eight seconds to fifteen seconds. So um, let me go ahead and share my share my screen here, and uh, let's see let's see what we got. So this is uh, this is uh, as they used to say, this is live television, and so things you know things go wrong, but. Um, so here you're looking at a live view of the comet coming in. This is the this is the nucleus of the comet here, and I and I'm actually still adjusting the display. So you'll see I have a, a three color sensor. So you'll see the three different uh, loops here for the the different colors. I'm going to try and get rid of that color cast here. That maybe is a little better. And now let me try and adjust the exposure a bit and see if I can make things any better. So. Um, it, it might surprise you, but the sky is still not completely dark. And so I've got some uh, artifacts going on here. You can see I have some vignetting on my screen here uh, where, where the camera doesn't have quite as much sensitivity or it's actually the optical tube of the telescope a little bit that you're seeing. But let me, uh, let, me, I, I, let, me, let me go and uh, tell you a little bit about what we've got going on here. Uh, so... Here's a, a view of what, uh, what the equipment is in my observatory here. So this is the telescope that we're looking through right now. It is an 11 inch uh, telescope. It's uh, what's called an astrograph and I won't go through the details except to tell you that it's a little bit of an odd instrument. This is a telescope that you cannot look through with your eye. I, right here, which is the front of the telescope, the objective of the telescope, there is a camera, this little red red thing here. And it's a one-shot color camera. It's a CMOS camera, not so different from the one that you have in your cell phone or the uh, the one that you have as if you have a DSLR. But um, it has the advantage of being very um, uh, sensitive. It actually has a cooler inside it, and it is currently cooled to uh, minus 10 Celsius, which is, I, I think, around zero degrees Fahrenheit or probably a little bit lower. So uh, that helps reduce the noise on, uh, on the camera uh, itself. So and I have it on a, on a mount here. This mount is tracking the, uh, the night sky. And uh, so th this is the setup that we're, we're using. And over here off the right side of the screen is uh, the computer that I'm using to capture the images. And so here, uh, once again, is the comment. I'm going to adjust it a little bit. So these are real-time images that are coming in as we speak. And so you can see the tail of the comet here. I can see the, uh, the nucleus has got a, a distinct green color to it. This is an artifact of the, uh, of the observing because we're not quite dark yet. But, uh, and you can see the tail coming off here. Now, uh, the tail has got a little bit of a spread. Let me show you, uh, let me go back to a picture that I took a, uh, whoops a couple of nights ago, and uh, maybe I have a, uh, I, I guess I can use this one. So this picture here, I took from the very same location, except I used my DSLR for this one. And uh, you can see here, this is, uh, here's the comet. The comet has two distinct tails, actually, and you can only see one of them really well in this picture here. But this is the, uh, this is what we call the dust tail. And the dust tail is exactly what it sounds like. It is dust coming off the comet. Comets are really kind of dirty snowballs. And so as the comet rounded the sun uh, back on July 3rd, uh, it began to heat up and throw off uh, dust particles, dust grains. And these are reflective to light. So you're actually seeing the light of the sun 
uh, reflecting off the dust grains here. And so that, that is giving us this, this bright, uh, bright color here. Now, if you, let me go to a different uh, image here, uh, stand by. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture from somebody that's a much better photographer than I am. So this gentleman here, uh, Gerald Raymond in um, Austria, I believe, took a very nice picture of the comet. And here you can see that same dust tail that I showed you in my photograph, but here is this blue tail. Now the blue tail is what is called the ion tail. And this is uh, chemical compounds that are coming off of the comet and the, the light from the sun is breaking them up and ionizing that. And that ionization that actually glows in this blue light. So the interesting thing is you'll notice here the very, uh, that same green glow that we have, the nucleus of the comet's about three kilometers or so in diameter, about, uh, I think five kilometers, excuse me, about three miles in diameter as the, our best guess. We can't image the uh, nucleus directly. But uh, so here's the nucleus, here is the dust tail, and the dust tail follows the orbit of the comet around the sun. And as I mentioned, uh, the comet uh, rounded the sun back just earlier this month, and uh, it is now, it was closest to the Earth a few days ago. It is now racing away from us, as John had mentioned. This tail right here, the ion tail, is a parallel to the particles that are coming off the sun, which we call the solar wind. So you have two distinctive tails and all comets uh, exhibit this. Uh, if you go back and look at Wikipedia or you Google uh, comets of the past, you'll see this same uh, kind of phenomena because of the ge geometry. Sometimes they look different. Sometimes they're on top of each other. Sometimes they're almost, uh, they almost appear to be opposite from one another, but that's really kind of just based on our view angle. So uh, the comet here is, uh, as I say, uh, came by uh, us just a few days ago, our, our closest approach. And let me flip back to my chart here and make sure I tell you all the important stuff. So interestingly, so you, you might have called it, heard it called Comet NEOWISE. That's an acronym. We love a good acronym. Uh, that's the NASA Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer satellite and that will be one of the questions that Sinan asks you on the survey so uh, make sure you get that one right. Uh, it was discovered recently just at, back in at the end of March and uh, passed around the sun on July 3rd uh, closest to the earth on the 23rd. This is the brightest comet in a quarter of a century. Uh, Hale-Bopp in 1997 was the last one. It was a little brighter than this one. Uh, as I say it's a dirty snowball. Comets are very interesting to us because they, uh, they literally are sort of time capsules from the formation of the solar system. And um, if you have not had a chance to go out and see the comet yet, it is definitely getting tougher by the day. I would suggest if you go, uh, go soon, uh, bring yourself a pair of binoculars and uh, find yourself a low horizon, pre uh, preferably something uh, dark, uh, uh, dark as you can. And this comet won't be back for uh, about 6,700 years. So. Uh, so catch it now uh, while you can. And maybe before I, I let go of, uh, of my time here, you'll see that these little curves are starting to move to the left. This is darker. And so as the sky is getting darker here, I'm going to adjust my display. And okay, I'm getting a little bit of red there. Let me see if I can adjust this and get a quick shot. That lines up the curves. I guess rid of the red cast. And let me try and see if I can get some of the tail back. Okay, well, not as much as I had hoped. But as I say, we've got quite a bit of moon tonight. But uh, you can definitely get that dust tail coming off the comet. And uh, there's an ion tail right here. Unfortunately, we just don't have quite as enough, uh, um, quite as dark of a sky as we need to be able to pick up that ion tail. But um, I think that's all I've got about the comment, unless uh, somebody has got a question. OK, I think I will uh, then turn it over to uh, back to John. Actually, at this point, I think we'll take it over to Sinan and see what she can oh, tell Sinan. us about, okay. Very good. about comments. You're muted, Sinan. 
Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, let me get my screen shared. Um, so a lot of people actually uh, would think, oh, whether um, we have uh, comets and also uh, the asteroids, right? Whether they are the same thing or not. Um, and the answer would be, no, they are not. Because as um, uh, many just described, the comets are dirty snowballs and they originated from a, um, a region really far away from the sun. Um, they visit the sun once in a while. Um, they are typical size ranges from about one to 12, uh, one to 20 kilometers, uh, which is about uh, 2,500 feet to about uh, like 10 miles. So that's about the size of two blocks or a city. So it actually spans a pretty wide range. Um, and what's fun, especially you have a K through 12 student at home, is that you could actually do a fun activity to make your comments at home with everyday household materials. I also have this link um, included in the comment section below, just in case you are interested in checking that out. So since the comments are made of ice, uh, they're not really going to cause any severe problems when they enter the Earth atmosphere because the ice could just melt and uh, they would just um, um, get burned away, mostly. So after you do the make your own comet activity, um, one thing you might hopefully learn is uh, there are actually a lot of uh, chemicals and elements that are considered very important to the present day Earth and life that we found in the comets. For example, comets are very rich in water ice. And during the very early history of Earth formation, uh, there were actually a lot of impacts from asteroids and also comets. So comets could have brought uh, a lot of water to Earth. And now we know 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. It could have also brought a lot of nitrogen, which is found in proteins. And we know that, um, for, for example, our hair or our nails, those are all full of protein. And to think about the air that we breathe, 78% of the air is made of nitrogen. And it's actually the presence of nitrogen that, that make the air more breathable and stable. And finally, there are also carbon compounds found in comets. We know that our body or um, all the life on Earth is considered as carbon-based because we have to eat um, carbon in order to have our body metabolize or just keep it alive. So comets might have brought uh, the building blocks of life to Earth because there are carbon found in it. You might have noticed that uh, I have said a lot of might or might have just because all the, all the work are still in progress and uh, we don't have a solid answer yet. Some of you may ask, well, I know comets formed really far away from the Earth, but how far? Well, there are mainly two places that you could uh, possibly find comets. One is called the Kuiper Belt, which uh, Pluto is in orbit. So they're about 30 to 50, uh, 50 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And also within the plane where all the planets are orbiting the sun. And the second place is called the Oort Cloud, where um, it's a spherical shell that defines the outer edge of the solar system. It could be as far as 1,000, sorry, 100,000 times larger than the distance between the sun and the earth. So let's actually watch a video here to see where these places are with respect to the solar system. And I do hope you could see this. Now we have the Jupiter's orbit, and here's the Kuiper belt where Pluto is. And this part of the sphere, spherical shell is actually the Oort cloud. And you can see that we actually zoomed out a lot to be able to see this sphere. 
So uh, that's how or cloud, um, how, how far it is from us. And if we come back, um, now we know that uh, Kuiper Belt are pretty far away, but Oort clouds is even further. Um, so if we put everything into the image here, we have the inner solar system right here, um, all the terrestrial planets uh, surrounded by the Astro Belt. And if we zoom out a little bit, we have the Kuiper Belt here where we would find uh, short period comets, which are defined as orbital period less than 200 years. So for example, the Halley's Comet, very famous, it comes around the sun or um, comes around um, and we'll be able to see it on earth about every 76 years, but that's still considered as a short period. And the long period comets are from the Oort cloud just because it's really far away and takes a lot of time to, for the comet to actually travel from that distance to the inner planet. So one example would be this comet that we just looked at, uh, the Neowise, which has a, an orbit about 70, uh, 6,700 years. Um, and after this time, it will um, again travel away from the sun and back to the Oort cloud. So um, we already had a quick look at what comets are, but what about asteroids? Well, asteroids are something different from comets because they're pieces of rocks or metals and are therefore a lot denser um, and heavier than comets of the same size. So they're considered as leftovers from the early solar system formation. Um, and these are the pieces that have never been able to even be part of a rocky planet. And this is just a, um, a, an example of an asteroid. So the asteroid belt contains about 2 million asteroids between the orbit uh, of Mars and Jupiter. Some would wonder, well, if there used to be a planet that later was torn apart. Well, the answer is probably not. Despite the large number of the rocks in the asteroid belt, its total mass is only about 18% of that of the moon or about 22% that of Pluto, which would have been too small even to be considered as a planet. Also, just because Jupiter is very close by, so its gravity actually dominates the nearby regions and probably have prevented the asteroids to stick together to form a rocky planet. Finally, are asteroids shooting stars? Well, they could cause or lead to shooting stars um, because asteroids have sizes that range from one meter, which is three feet, to 1,000 1, kilometers, which is about 600 miles. And here you can see, well, these are some of the asteroids and they could be as big as a city. So it would be a disaster if the larger ones are actually visiting Earth very frequently. So for shooting stars, um, they are actually caused by meteoroids, uh, the pebble-sized rocks um, entering the Earth's atmosphere. Sometimes asteroids could break down to form those meteoroids. So the shooting part actually comes from where the rock is getting burned and is essentially caught on fire during its entry through the Earth's atmosphere. Well, if there's any leftover parts after a meteorite travels, through the atmosphere, then there would be a meteorite or a space rock left on the ground free for, for pickup. Well, like this in the picture. So I guess that's everything that I'd uh, like to share about comets and asteroids. Excellent, thank you. So do we have any activity from the chat room that we should be addressing or do we move on? So we have two questions. Um, First question, why has Comet Neowise moved so spectacularly with respect to the Big Deeper each night? So I, I this is Manny, I could take that one. So, uh, and I think I saw a second question there too. So, uh, so most of the objects in the, in the night sky, the stars, the nebulae, all those things are, are very, very far away. And so even though they may be moving with respect to each other, uh, 
yeah, along our line of sight, they're not moving very much. They basically appear to be stationary and, and everything is, is fairly much in the same place. The comet, as we discussed, has whipped around the sun um, uh, a few uh, couple of weeks ago. And so it's actually changing in position against the, the quote unquote fixed background stars uh, on, on literally uh, a minute by minute basis. And uh, if we were able to take a couple of photos of the comet, literally just, uh, I would say just an hour apart, you would be able to see that it is moving uh, with respect to the stars. So um, it, it is actually in an orbit around, uh, an ar around the sun in a highly elliptical orbit, uh, an oblong orbit, if you will. And so just like the planets, which change, as John mentioned, which change position night to night to night, uh, with respect to the background stars, the comet does the same thing. And I think there was another com uh, a question that was asked about uh, the tail and why is the tail curved? Well, actually the tail is curved because the comet is moving uh, along at that elliptical, that uh, oblong orbit. And so what you're actually seeing is that dust uh, along that curved orbit of the comet. So you're actually seeing the, the curved dust tail, which is following the, the curved orbit of the comet. So as we mentioned, the ion tail, straight as an arrow away from the sun, the dust tail curved along the orbital path of the comet. Hope that answers it. Any other questions to address? Nope. All right, then let's go back outside and look up at the sky. So here we have tonight's sky as it looks right now. Well, hold on. As it looks now. And remember that that line we were talking about, that orange line, the ecliptic, where we'll find the planets. And there over here we see indeed Jupiter and Saturn. And m many of our objects tonight that we'll be looking at are actually found in the constellation Sagittarius. Now, for many people, when they think of Sagittarius, they think of as half horse, half man guy running around shooting arrows through the sky, kind of like this guy here. However, if you're an astronomer, you typically are gonna think about Sagittarius as a teapot, not a centaur. And a teapot, let me show you this, our teapot. So here we have sides of the teapot, the lid of the teapot, the base of the teapot, the spout of the teapot, and the handle of the teapot. And that, when you look in the southern sky right now, kind of low in the sky in the south, you should be able to find the teapot. And then you will know that that is Sagittarius. And one of the cool things about the teapot is it actually is brewing some tea right now and there's steam coming out of this pot. And that, if you're in a sufficient dark location, that is the Milky Way, the stars, clouds, gases of, of, the, uh, of the Milky Way galaxy, that you can see that. And another pretty cool thing about Sagittarius over there is that pretty much right around this circle is where if you were to head directly in that direction, you'd make it to the, to the central core of our galaxy. So Sagittarius, it's a pretty cool place. If you can go out there at some night, during the summer with a pair of binoculars and just explore, let your binoculars wander around, you'll see all kinds of really cool stuff, star clusters, nebulae, et cetera. So without further ado, we're going to look into the constellation Sagittarius. And as uh, Zunan was just talking to us about asteroids and comets, we have a, a Randy is gonna try and hunt down an asteroid for us. So. Take it away, Randy. Very good. Let me go to, do you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Let me go to the star chart, kind of like what you were doing here. Let's see if I can share this. Let's see how successful I am. Okay, do you see a star, a, uh, star chart? Yes, we see the star chart. Okay, here's Sagittarius, like John just talked about. If you go up above the teapot right up here with his little antenna getting free TV, 
and zoom in right here where this uh, arrow is here, which is zoom in here, and we go to an asteroid. It's uh, the um, fourth brightest asteroid that we have in the main belt, and it's uh, the fifth biggest one, which is roughly around 124 or so miles across. Now, you're not going to see the thing because it's uh, you know, a little shy of twice as far away as the sun is from the Earth. But on this star chart, you'll see these three stars standing up like this. And this top one is um, uh, the asteroid Iris. And I'm going to jump ahead one hour and I want you to see if everybody can see it actually move. We'll suddenly skip over to the right. Let me go another hour and we'll skip over to the right which is about what it'll be at 11.30 tonight. Now I'm gonna reduce this down and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show the real thing. Um, do you see a sky pattern of, of dots? Yes, we do. Okay, you look at these center three ones right here. And this is uh, the asteroid Iris right here. It was making a little bit more of a bent stick with these two other stars here, but as time has been going on, it's been straightening up. If we come back in another half hour or, or so, you will probably see it move over just a little bit. And that's what I wanted, to, if we can all see that. In case you don't get to, I'm gonna do one. This was a test shot that I did uh, about three weeks ago. And I picked Iris uh, here because it was a fast mover. Let me hit the play button and you'll see this top star over here uh, the roughly each one jumps about eight minutes. Um, so you see this time lapse, but that is Iris moving. Now it doesn't look like much because it's so far away. This thing is actually moving 16 times faster than the fastest rifle bullet. So if you were out in space out there mining some asteroid or something like that, and you weren't moving very much, and you had this thing plow into you, that would be pretty devastating to have 124 mile wide diameter asteroid hit you going 16 times faster than the fastest rifle bullet. So we're going to let um, the, the comet do its thing. By the way, this is a photo, actually a real photo. We haven't had a flyby. This is roughly what it looks like. It's made of, of uh, kind of common materials. It's, uh, it's stone uh, with some sprinkling of some nickel and iron along its surface, probably debris from other uh, impacts. Um, but that is... Um, that is the uh, asteroid Iris, and we'll come back later and see if we can see it actually move. Awesome. Thank you, Randy. Okay, now we're going to stay in the constellation Sagittarius, and this time we're going to start looking at some planets. And we'll start with the biggest planet, the king of the planets. And for that, we'll go to Brian. Thanks, John. I'll bring up my screen here. So let's take a look first at a picture of Jupiter that I photographed using a robotic telescope in the Canary Islands. So I actually took this at seven o'clock uh, this evening. We're still light here for us in Southern California, but quite dark in the Canary Islands. This shows us Jupiter, the king of the planets. You may notice that there's three other dots in this picture. These are three of the four Galilean satellites. So Galileo, way back in 1610, pointed his telescope that he made himself up at Jupiter and saw these four stars, started with three, a few days later he saw a fourth one. And he noticed that they moved among each other in relation to Jupiter. So from this picture, what we're looking at is the, the moons Io and then Ganymede and Europa. Now there's a fourth one called Callisto. Uh, that one's off the screen, so we cannot see it in this picture. Jupiter, as John mentioned, that is the king of the planets. Where is it located? Well, it's fifth planet from our sun. And while it is the largest planet, it's actually twice as massive as all the other planets combined, believe it or not. If you took an Earth and lined up Earth-sized planets along the equator, you could actually line up 11 Earths to go all the way across. That's how wide Jupiter is. Now, while one full day on Earth is 24 hours, we're pretty used to that, on Jupiter, 
a full day is only nine hours, 56 minutes. In other words, Jupiter spins around one full rotation in just under 10 hours. That is a really short day. Well, you'll notice the cloud bands. We're going to talk about those a little bit more. But before we go to the cloud bands, let me tell you a little bit more about me and the equipment that I'm using. So my name is Brian Cox, and I'm in Oak Hills, California. That's on the 15 freeway on the way up from Riverside, heading up towards the high desert into Victorville and then on to Las Vegas. So I'm in my backyard, and this is the equipment I'm using. It is a Orion 120 millimeter telescope. And that 120 millimeters is just under five inches. I'm using a Celestron mount with a Malincam camera. So with this setup, we can actually show you a live view of Jupiter. So let's actually switch right over to that live view. I'm going to bring up my Malincam program. So this is a live view right now of Jupiter. The first thing that I'm going to do is actually modify my view so that we can zoom in a little bit. So this is called a region of interest. And then I'll increase my size here so we can see a little bit bigger. So there's Jupiter. You'll notice it's quite shaky. That shakiness, so to speak, is because of our atmosphere. The Earth's cooling off right now, and as that heat rises, it actually wrinkles the light waves that's coming from Jupiter. We can uh, really see these bands. Now, while we could see Jupiter here, let's take a moment and adjust the settings so we can see the moons. I'm going to increase that gain, and then I'll actually back out my zoom a little bit so I can get them in here. And then I'll bring up the exposure time. And here is three of the four. Now, these moons are orbiting Jupiter, of course, so they've already moved from uh, two and a half hours or so ago when I took that other picture. This shows us Io here on the left. Here's Europa. And now Callista, or I'm sorry, Callisto is in view. Where's Ganymede? Ganymede is occulted by Jupiter right now. In other words, it's being blocked. So Ganymede is behind Jupiter, and um, she'll come out in a little bit. A few more facts about Jupiter. It takes just over 12 of our Earth years for Jupiter to go around the sun once. This planet is a, what's called a gas giant. It's actually made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. If Jupiter even has a solid core at, at all, we think it would be just about the size of Earth. So it's, that's why we call it a gas giant. One last thing I'd like to say, according to NASA, at the last count, Jupiter had 79 moons. Well, why don't we know how many moons Jupiter has? Because they're quite small. We talked about four big ones, the Galilean moons, but they're smaller and smaller. So as we point more equipment and get probes, satellites out towards Jupiter, we are actually detecting more satellites. So our count is up to 79. And with that, John, I'll pass it back to you. Awesome, thank you, Brian. So now we're gonna stay again in Sagittarius and we're gonna look at yet another planet, the one that many people consider the most beautiful of planets. And for that, we'll go to Jose. Jose. Jose, if you're talking, you're muted. Well, maybe we'll come back for Jose a little bit later and we'll move on uh, to. I'm here. All right. I just couldn't get this thing to open up uh, on the full screen. All right. I'm ready. Okay. My name is Jose Castro. I am a member of the Riverside Astronomical Society. Um, uh, I assist John in doing outreach for the club, and I'm living in Moreno Valley, California. Uh, I'm going to be showing you some views of Saturn, like views of Saturn from my backyard. I do have my own observatory. You might see some equipment behind me, and that is a telescope mounted on the pier. Now, as he said, I'm going to be showing you some live views of the keen of the rings and the jewel of the solar system, the sixth planet from the sun. It is a gas giant. Uh, 
it's 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 considered one of the most beautiful things that we can look at and without further ado i am gonna be showing you what it looks like from my backyard and this is a live image of the planet saturn right now again just like brian's jupiter you can see a little bit of uh waving on the on the image of the planet and that is caused because of the turbulence uh, we're looking at this through uh the heat waves that are radiating from the nearby houses and and the cool air hitting the the, the heat is, is causing this distortion atmospheric distortion now bear in mind we're looking at an object that is about a billion miles away from earth all right so yes there is a lot of distance to cover for that uh light to hit your iris now um i'm going to tell you a couple of things about saturn all right um it is it is um not only a billion miles away but it's also um it, it is estimated if you're going to take measurements in uh, uh, astronomical units, it will take you sometime around 82.3 light minutes uh, to travel from, from Saturn to Earth. And um, the daytime on this planet, it also rotates in, in less than 10 hours, just like Jupiter. Um, and that brings us to have about 10,759 Earth days before Saturn can, can do a loop around the sun. So we got the numbers are like kind of really, really, really drastically different from Earth. Now, it is a gas giant, uh, as uh, you can imagine. It has these ringlets around of it of mostly rock and ice. And um, yes, we do have one of the moons of Saturn is considered to be uh, uh, a, a world of ice and, and scientists estimate there is oceans of water, liquid water underneath that, um, that ice cap. Um, we have a planet that is really, really colossal. It's the second uh, largest planet on, on the solar system. Um, it's really, really light um, and mostly composed of hydrogen and helium. Um, this is a planet that even though it's so huge, you can actually make it float on water if you could grab it and put it on the ocean or something, or maybe in your uh, bathtub, if you could fit it in there. If you have a big bathroom, maybe you can do that. Um, it's, um, it's uh, let me see, something here. Um, it, it has a little bit of material from Earth in it. And this was caused because we crashed a spacecraft called Cassini that uh, it was for 13 years taking images of this planet. So yes, we have a footprint somewhere in there in that gas uh, behemoth. Um, from our, us over here. And um, just as a fun fact, you know that about every 29 years or so, if you take a look at Saturn, you're gonna look and see, wait a minute, where are the rings? They disappear. Well, that is because about every 29 years, the uh, inclination of the planet rings appear to be uh, invisible. And it's just that they're like, head on they're looking at us they're you know we're face on towards each other and you don't get to see this all right um the last thing that i can tell you about this planet is that we have around uh maybe eight nine uh, uh earth that you can put across on the equator of this planet before you can actually reach both ends of the of the edges of the planet all right um I think that's that's all I got for tonight. Thank you, and I'll bring it back to John. Great, thank you very much, Jose. Now, Sunan, what can you tell us about the solar system? Thank you, John. Now I'm gonna be sharing with everyone uh, something 
that's a little bit different uh, from what we just talked about. Um, so we all have um, already seen those planets, right? The king and the queen of the, the planets. Um, and this is actually a true comparison of the planets all together with the sun. So we have the inner rocky planets starting from here, Mercury, Venus, Earth and the moon, Mars. So they are all, they're called rocky or terrestrial or inner planets. And they're pretty small and dense just because they're made of um, rocks and uh, metal, heavy metals mainly. And starting from here, we have the outer planets, which are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So those you can see are uh, com comparably large. Uh, they are also puffy. The gas giants are very puffy. Um, and these two, Uranus and Neptune, those are called ice giants just because they are farther away from the sun where there could actually be ice on the surface. And uh, I know a lot of people actually uh, remembers and love Pluto. So here you go, here is Pluto. And the other three are also dwarf planets, which are smaller than uh, the inner planets, but larger than asteroids. And Brian mentioned that you could actually uh, fit about 1300 Earth all inside of Jupiter. Um, but did you know that you could fit about a thousand Jupiter inside the sun? And that's actually how large the sun is. And now we're going to look at, um, at a different perspective um, regarding why would we have these two different categories of planets. So first, let's take a look at Jupiter's in internal structure. So uh, both Jupiter and Saturn, they're very puffy. And actually, Saturn could even float on water. Um, this is uh, the inner structure of Jupiter. And you could see that it's actually made of a lot of hydrogen. So it has uh, the clouds and gas um, hydrogen as its thick atmosphere. And as we go down, go uh, more towards the center, uh, the hydrogen becomes a liquid and metallic state just because inside there's a lot of pressure due to gravity and uh, hydrogen is in a more compressed state. And the inner core, if there is actually a, a solid one, would probably be rocky. And if we do a side-by-side -side comparison of the gas giants, the ice giants, these are Uranus and Neptune, and also Earth, and these are all two scale, uh, the true size comparison. So when we look at their compositions, you would see that Jupiter and Saturn are mostly made of hydrogen. So those are the, the light and dark gray colors. And for Uranus and Neptune, they actually have a, a gaseous atmosphere that is rich of hydrogen and helium, and their mantles are uh, made of um, uh, water, ammonia, and methane ices. So those are pretty much the eyes of um, hydrogen compounds. So um, that's why they are very light in density, just because instead of uh, being made by rocks, they were actually made mainly by hydrogen, which is the lightest element in the universe or its compound. And if we take a look at the Earth structure, um, I bet some people are very familiar with um, already these layers, right? So one thing we could notice is that there are actually a lot of heavy metals or heavy dense materials. So the metal, we have rocks, which is uh, silicate. And going inside, we have all the heavy metals, uh, including iron and nickel. And this is why Earth is pretty much um, a lot denser than those uh, gas and ice giants. So one question uh, people may think is, okay, why do we see two completely different categories of planets in the same solar system? Well, this had something to do with the formation of the solar system. So here, um, imagine that it was almost uh, 50 billion years ago, and we had the sun at the center um, it was still a protostar, which is uh, the sun, but in a very a primitive stage. 
So it was trying to become a structurally stable star uh, where the outward pointing pressure due to hits um, uh, due to the heat inside would balance it uh, gravity pulling inwards. So it's just, just trying to establish itself as a regular main sequence star. And at the same time, the planets were formed in a disk and over time slowly getting their spherical shape. As you can see here, there, were, there was actually a lot of gas when the disk first formed. And that was mainly hydrogen and some helium in the disk. So the primitive planets were trying to gain mass and also grow in size by accreting the gas and surrounding materials onto themselves with their gravity. So the inner region of the solar system right here, where we've, we found all the inner planets, it was really hot just because it was so close to the sun. Gas in the inner region couldn't really condense, so it just per permeated in space. Only materials that could endure high temperature and condense were those rocky and metallic materials. So they condensed, aggregated together, and also over time grow into the proto inner planets. Remember those heavy elements uh, such as iron, nickel, and also sil silicon, those were a lot more rare compared to uh, helium or hydrogen, which was the, the two most abundant element in the universe. So the inner planets really started with uh, very little materials to work with, and that's why they ended up being very small in size. So if we move out a little bit, uh, the outer region of the solar system was relatively cool because it was farther away from the sun. So in those regions, the gas could actually condense a little bit or at least uh, was able to fall onto the planets. So that was why the, the gas giants um, were um, like, are large and puffy just because hydrogen and helium, they were really abundant and Jupiter and Saturn were able to accrete a lot of them onto themselves. And finally, at the edge of the gaseous disk, uh, the temperature was cool enough to actually enable the formation of ice. So water ice and uh, ice of other hydrogen compounds were able to be retained and become part of Uranus and Neptune. This kind of formation model could also explain why we uh, found comets uh, at the edge of the solar system, just because they were formed really far away from the sun, um, where hydrogen compound ice was very abundant. So with that, I hope you enjoy this little science story. Back to you, John. Excellent, thank you, Sinan. So do we have any activity from the chat room that we should be talking about? Nope. Nope, all right, chat room is kind of quiet or at least has been taken care of. Okay, so let's go back outside and look at the sky. So we've been talking about the ecliptic earlier. Remember that line across the sky where we find the planets? And again, here we see Jupiter and Saturn still making its way across the sky. There's Sagittarius, the teapot, kind of go a little bit farther across the sky. And you see not only planets moving across the ecliptic, but also is the moon. Right now the moon is in the constellation called Libra in the southwest part of the sky. So you see way over here to the left side of your screen, you see that teapot of Sagittarius. Next to Sagittarius is Scorpius. And then we have Libra. And there is the moon. The moon is in Libra tonight but the moon moves a lot from night to night. So it'll be somewhere else tomorrow. And here to tell us about the moon is Alex. Hi everybody, I'm Alex. And I wanna start my screen sharing and things like that here. I'm gonna share my whole screen and uh, that should be doing it. And then we'll come over here, start a PowerPoint for you. Uh, 
Let's go, Mr. Computer. There we go. I'm Alex McConaughey, and I am going to be showing you the moon tonight. Uh, but first, I, I just want to say, well, I'm from Moreno Valley, California, and I'm using that Celestron telescope. You can't see it behind me, but there it is in the picture there. It's a nine and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. But the, the message I want to start with was I'm really excited about um, the fact that Manny could show us a comet today because comets played a big role in my love for the for the sky. I was um, um, I was just a baby when my daddy would take me to Griffith Observatory and I couldn't afford a telescope back then. It was some 40 years later before I finally went to a a star party put on by the Riverside Astronomical Society where we were looking at a comet. And so for the first time, I saw people with telescopes that I could actually afford. And that started me on my hobby of astronomy. And I know that it's kind of weird right now that we've got this coronavirus thing going, but it will end. And I hope that someday you will be able to come out to a regular outreach with us and uh, enjoy a putting I putting an eyepiece um, to your eye and looking through a telescope but we're here tonight to look at the moon and um, if you were with us last night I showed you that the five day old moon and it was a crescent and this is what a crescent looks like over here and now it's an eight day moon or just about an eight day moon and it looks more like gibbous it's gotten fatter so learn those terms, crescent and gibbous. The moon is right now waxing, it's getting bigger. And pretty soon after it gets to day 14, when it's full, it'll start waning and getting smaller. So those are important terms to learn when you're gonna learn about being an astronomer. Um, as, you, as you might remember, this graph from last week, you see how the moon moves around further and further around the earth as, as the month goes on? Well, tonight we're right about here. Uh, we're past this and we're before this, past this and before this. So it's, it's more than a half moon and it's getting fatter. Um, and then, I want to take you to some things we can look at. Remember the Terminator? That Terminator is this area where the sun is just rising on the moon. That's that sunrise on the moon. And it's the it's a cool place to look because it's where you get the sharpest definition between the light and the dark stuff, best contrast. And I've highlighted some of the things we've got on the eight day old moon. And um, the spacecraft are kind of cool. Uh, starting all the way down here with L cross down at the bottom, that's a rather recent, about 10 years ago, they actually sent a rocket into the moon. They crashed a rocket into the moon so that they could blow a hole, a big meteor, just like all these other meteors. They made a big old meteor uh, cr crash into there. It was, a, it was an Atlas rocket and it blew stuff up into the, um, into the atmosphere and um, then they sent another rocket uh, just a few minutes later to analyze everything that was in there. They were looking for water and that's how they were doing it. Surveyor 6 is kind of important because you guys don't remember this because you're not old enough. But back in the olden days, we didn't know what the moon looked like. We had to send rocket ships up there to take pictures of the moon and it was hard to do. These two ships being right together, Luna 2 and Apollo 15, this is about where they were. What's really cool about this is that Apollo 15 was, was the first real exploration of the moon. Until we got there, we were kind of limited to just walking around a little bit, but now we landed a rover. And Luna 2 was is a reminder that it's a Russian spacecraft. And it's a reminder that until 1968, we were behind the Russians in all this going to the moon thing. But the real thing I wanna point out to you today is some mare. Okay, these are the mare. Okay, what happened was that the early moon was pockmarked. It all looked like this. The whole thing looked like this. And because the meteors were hitting it and things like that, well, eventually that bombardment of meteors stopped because we ran out of meteors floating around free in the solar system. Sometime after that, lava flowed up and this dark lava flowed up into great pools of lava and erased all of this disturbance. And that's where we get the Maria. And they're called different things. The Sea of Tranquility, Sea of Tranquility, I'm sorry, down here, and the Sea of Serenity up here. And right on the eighth day, 
we have the sea of, um, of showers. And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to get out of my PowerPoint so that you can, can, you know, you can see what you really came to see. And this, this is the live view of the moon. This over here is the live view. And this is the the stuff we were just looking at. And um, you see these these three craters in one? They're right here, these three craters in one. And you can see that the picture that I've grabbed for the eight day moon is actually a little bit further along than we are right now. And in the time that we've been watching this tonight, I, I have seen this Terminator actually creep out. And this little this little part right here this little part right here, it wasn't all lit up before. But in the time that we've been listening to all the other things going on, that's what's happened. Now, let's take a look up here at one of these Mario. And as we, well, I went the wrong way. Now we're in the craters and well, we'll go to the craters real quick, just cause I wanna show you what they look like up closer. If I can get that to work right. You can see that the area is disturbed. And by the way, remember how everybody was saying how the, the atmosphere is disturbed and so things are moving around? Okay, that's what that looks like. But if we reposition the telescope so that it is looking at a Maria or one of the seas, we'll put that circle right up here. Now look, compare that to how smooth the mare are. See how smooth that area is? There are a few uh, meteors that have hit since the lava flowed in there. And, you know, that's happened since then, but not too many. And that's our view of the moon tonight. I hope you come back again next month for some more or something. Okay, bye-bye. All right, thank you, Alex. Do we have any chat activity to be discussed or responded to? Nope. Nope. All right, then. And now we're going to go back outside and look at the sky again. Now, this time we're going to explore the, the probably the most famous star that there is. And for that, we're going to, don't get dizzy, we're going to circle around to the north. And in particular, we're looking at the North Star. And I'm gonna take you back over here to the Big Dipper, which you may recall from when we started out looking for the comet. The Big Dipper here helped us find the comet. And today it'll help us find the North Star. So if you look at the bowl of the Big Dipper, it's got the last two stars of that bowl. They point this right over here to the North Star. Now, the cool thing about the North Star is that it does not move. I'm going to see here, they're going to go here in the middle place. They're going to place the, the North Star in the middle of our screen. And now I'm going to highlight it for you so you don't lose track of it. So this little circle shows us where the North Star is. And now I'm gonna do my nifty little trick and accelerate the passage of time once again. Now watch what happens to the stars on the left side of your screen, the right side of the screen, and compare that to what happens to the North Star. So you see on the, the left side of your screen, looking to the west, you see the Big Dipper dropping down low, closer and closer to the horizon. And if you look over to the right side of your screen, you see the constellations and the stars rising up in the east, rising up into the sky. Whereas all this time, the North Star there in that middle in that circle is not moving at all. It is directly above the North Pole of this planet of, of Earth. And so it, at night, it's a true reading of where is North. So you can figure out all the rest of the directions of the compass once you know where North is. And once you find the North Star, you can always find it again. Like you go out in your backyard tonight, look at the Big Dipper, find where it's pointing to the North Star. And that North Star is going to be there next week, next month, next year, always in the same spot. Whereas other constellations, or excuse me, and, and stars 
rise in the east, set in the west, just like the sun. And uh, some constellations are not visible at all in the summertime. Like you've probably heard of the constellation Orion with Orion's belt. You can't see Orion during the summer, at least not at the normal times people are awake. Uh, you have to wait for wintertime and spring to be able to see that. Um, but the star, the constellations right around the North Star, like the Big Dipper, those are visible all year long. They just circle around the North Star. They call them circumpolar constellations. I mean, they're always up in the sky. Other constellations, that get, once you get farther away from the North Star, those rise and set just like the sun and the moon. Anyway, that's a little lesson about the North Star, otherwise known as Polaris. So um, the final constellation that we're going to be talking about today is actually we're not going to so much talk about the constellations, but a constellation known as Volpecula, which is you've probably never heard that name before. It's not one of the famous constellations. It's rather obscure. And let's take a little visit to it because that's where we'll find our final target of the evening. So Volpecula, like I said, it doesn't really have any bright stars. It's not very large. It's kind of hard to find. However, if you know where to look, if you go outside right now and look up in the sky, you'll see a handful of pretty bright stars. The brightest of these stars is Vega. If you take Vega and draw a line over to Deneb, another bright star, and from Deneb, draw a line over to Altair, and then from Altair, you draw a line back up to Vega, you will have created what is known as the summer triangle. And it's a summer triangle because you can see it now during the summer. You, might, you can pretty much see it in the fall too, even though summer will have ended. And the reason I bring up the summer triangle is because right in the middle of that is Volpecula. And the reason we bring up Volpecula is because it houses one of the more beautiful things you can see in the night sky. And now for the first time, we're gonna go out beyond our solar system into interstellar space to see something amazing. So with that, I say, take it away, Amanda. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, can everyone see? Uh, so hi, yes, everyone. See. Great, thanks, John. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda. I am a graduate student at UC Riverside. And today we'll be observing together uh, remotely from a telescope that's located in Sonoma, California, called the Stone Edge Observatory. Um, I live in Illinois now, so it's pretty cool that I can just observe remotely from California. And feel free to follow along with me at StoneEdgeObservatory.com. So I thought it would be fun to show you what the observatory looks like. Uh, the, the dome is too small to actually observe inside, which is why we necessarily need to observe remotely. Um, a little bit about the telescope itself, uh, and if you're following along, feel free to jump to the FAQ with me. Uh, this is a half a meter telescope uh, with a field of view of around half a degree by half a degree. So if you take a picture uh, with this telescope uh, of the moon, you'll see the whole moon fit inside one picture. The second point that I wanted you guys to take away from this is uh, just a little bit of knowledge about filters. So Starnage Observatory uses six different filters, uh, three that are called broadband, which let in a lot of light, and three that are called narrowband, which let in very little amounts of light. And each one of these filters tells us something different about the object that we're observing, uh, different properties about the galaxy or the star or the planet or whatever we're observing. Um, so with that knowledge in mind, uh, let's get on to observing. Uh, so the interface that we use uh, to connect to the telescope is called uh, Slack. And we use this interface to send commands to the telescope. So let me send a command. I've already pointed to the object that we're looking at. Um, and the way you send a command is just by saying image 30 seconds for us to binning two and in the H alpha filter. So today we're going to be looking at a planetary nebula called the Dumbbell Nebula. And you'll see in around 30 seconds why it's called that. Um, the reason planetary nebula, it's actually not a planet. Uh, it's a misnomer. 
Uh, and the reason it was called planetary nebula is because when astronomers looked at this type of stuff uh, long centuries ago um, with their uh, lesser resolved telescopes, uh, the stuff that they were observing actually looked like planets. They thought when they looked at these objects that they were gas giants like Uranus or uh, or, Saturn, or Jupiter or Neptune that we've been uh, hearing about throughout this star party. Um, so here is a picture of the Dumbbell Nebula. You can kind of see why it's called the Dumbbell. It has this shape. So what is a planetary nebula? Uh, it is actually when a star reaches the end of its life cycle, it sheds all of its outer layers into the interstellar medium and it becomes very small uh, white dwarf called a white dwarf. Um, but all of this gas and all of these shells that it's shedding into the interstellar medium looks very spectacular, and thus this is what you see. Um, and usually in the center of the, um, of the planetary nebula is a white dwarf, and you can't really see it here. So what types of stars does this happen to? It actually happens for intermediary type stars, intermediary mass stars. Uh, what that means is it's around one to eight times the mass of the Milky Way. Uh, sorry, the mass of the sun. Um, and so the end of the life cycle of our sun is actually also going to end up as a planetary nebula. Um, some things to keep in mind. Let me just send another command to show you the difference between the filters. Uh, so while that's exposing, some things to notice is that there's a lot of dense knots of gas and dust uh, that's being shed from this, uh, from the central star, from the central star. Um, and so you can see that uh, this is kind of all around the planetary nebula. It's very symmetric. Um, and uh, let's see. So while we're waiting for this to expose, I just wanted to show you the difference between when you take it in an H alpha filter, uh, which shows you star forming um, gas and particles in the planetary nebula to when you take it in a filter called O3 which shows you the really, really energetic parts of the planetary nebula. So you can see that it looks very different. We're taking a picture of exactly the same object, but one is O3, which is the really, really high energy part of the planetary nebula, and one which is H alpha, which is sort of uh, the material that stars end up forming from. So if I toggle back and forth, you can kind of see that it's very different. And that's why we use different filters to give us more information and paint a more complete picture of the object that we're looking at. So if you take enough exposures of uh, this beautiful nebula in different filters, you can stack them into a color image. And this was previously done, but you can get something that looks like this. It's very beautiful. You can see the red is the H alpha filter that we've just talked about. And the blue is the O3 filter that we've just talked about. And when you, can combine, when you combine it, it shows uh, a more comprehensive picture of all of the physics that go on within the nebula. And if you look very close in the center, it's easier to see here, uh, there is the white dwarf, the star that started this all. Um, so from this very tiny star, you get all of this beautiful gas that's uh, being shed from it. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amanda. Okay, so Randy, as you may recall earlier in our evening, Randy was hunting for the asteroids and we were going to be, he was going to be monitoring the movements and see if they could share that with us. So we'll go to Randy and the asteroid hunt. Very good. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, let me go back to our telescope view, live view. Here's those three stars that we started out with. You notice this one has moved to the right here. This line sort of bent in the other direction. When we first started seeing it, it was over here to the left and it has now passed over here to the uh, right. So that has actually shown some movement going 16 times faster than a rifle bullet. And uh, just in case, um, I also, uh, let me bring up this real quick. This is a sequence that I did last night showing um, its movement. I'll just let it go through. And you can see it's moving here. And it blanks out because a tree trunk got in the way. But this is taken every five minutes. This is the same asteroid. This was just done last night. This is somewhat of a challenging or a little bit more of a challenging amateur 
sort of um, thing to do. Not a lot of amateurs have uh, have seen asteroids uh, because you have to figure out which dot is the one that's moving and come back the next night and try to verify it. So it's a little bit, it's kind of an intermediary kind of a challenge. But there you go, uh, asteroid iris. With that, back to John. Okay, we are getting close to wrapping up our evening here. Um, I do wanna uh, just make a little plug for our astronomy club, as I mentioned before, the Riverside Astronomical Society. We, uh, in the non-pandemic days, we have monthly meetings at La Sierra University where we have guest speakers come in like from NASA or universities and share their research. We have free snacks, we got raffles for prizes. Um, but while those meetings are still going on now, we have to do them like virtually so you don't get the free snacks. We also have a dark sky site up in the high desert near uh, north of Yucca Valley where you have a couple houses and 10 acres of land. You see the Milky Way and the moonless nights. Um, so that's a pretty nice perk of being part of the club, of having access to a really dark place. Um, and again, during the pandemic, that dark place is closed down. So we're kind of on hold until things, until the world gets a little healthier. Um, but anyway, here you see, um, I think in the chat box, you'll be able to find the, our, our website. But here it is, uh, www rivastro.org if you want to follow along with us there. And then also we have um, a bunch of resources if you're uh, interested in learning more about astronomy. And my guess is if you are still here listening to me speak after an hour and 20 minutes, uh, you're interested. So this program I've been showing you, The Night Sky, is a free download called Stellarium. You can install on your computer. Stellarium also has a web-based service that you can access via your Chromebook. It has a free app for your phone or tablet as well. Sky Safari is another excellent app available for tablets in both Android and Apple systems. Uh, skymaps.com, that website you can go to every month and download another uh, updated sky map because the sky does indeed change from month to month and where the planets are, if there's planets and things like that. So that's an, another free service. There's a couple of excellent magazines if you're interested in astronomy. Sky Telescope and Astronomy Magazine. You can pick those up over at Barnes & Noble or you get them off the internet. And finally, a couple of excellent books to get you started in the hobby of, science, the hobby of astronomy, the science of astronomy. We have Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. And that's good for high school and adults. This book at the bottom here is A Child's Introduction to the Night Sky by Michael Driscoll. That's an excellent book for third graders, fourth graders, middle schoolers, that sort of thing. Get them started in astronomy. Um, Sanan, and can you share about the UCR's program? Sure, thank you, John. I, mm -hmm. I'd like to quickly share with everyone um, our Facebook page. So here, we will actually be posting all the upcoming events, including this monthly virtual stargazing party. And we will also having uh, an upcoming Cosmic Thursdays lecture. Some of you uh, might know what that is. It's actually a, a public lecture um, based on astronomy and uh, it's designed uh, to be public, public and family friendly. So the next one will actually be in, um, in August, on August the, the 20th. So uh, feel free to just um, follow us on Facebook or um, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to be uh, updated. And it looks like we're probably going to be getting back together here on September 10th, uh, and the third in our monthly series, or almost monthly. Um, so if you've enjoyed us tonight, if you're still listening to me right now, it means you're still here and then you're probably going to want to join us again on September 10th. Tell your friends. Um, but I think otherwise, anything from the chat room we should talk about before we uh, before we move on and wrap this up? So there are three questions. The first one is um, from Michael asking about um, can amateurs such as ourselves use the Stone Edge telescope to tag our wall images? Uh, so um, 
currently the Stonehenge Observatory is really only used for educational outreach. So actually, if you're an educator or teacher, uh, reach out to me and maybe we can get something up uh, set up with, for your classroom or for your students. Uh, that would be awesome. So the second question is from Tom and he's asking about, will there be any benefit to building an observatory on the moon versus using the space uh, space based one like Hubble? Who would like to tackle that one? Well, I can- Observatory uh, on the moon. I could quickly comment on that one. So I know, uh, yes, the answer is yes, because uh, the moon is almost always just having one side facing us. So building a, an observatory on the far side, as we call it, of the moon would actually um, always be directly looking into the other way that's away from the earth. So especially if you're building a radio um, observatory there, it's gonna almost get a zero um, interference from the communications on the earth. So there's a, a lot of benefit. All right. Anybody else from the panel have anything they wanna share? Questions, comments? Uh, we we have up? a third question. Oh, I think. excellent. Yeah, third question is um, from Brandon. Uh, so the question is about, um, I think it's like talking about the image from the Stone Edge um, telescope. And the question is, are those colors, the actual colors or just rendered for differentiating the filters? Uh, the short answer is that they're rendered for the different filters because we can't really see in those wavelengths. The longer answer is that Color is kind of subjective. Uh, we have, we can see in a certain wavelength range, uh, but we can stack the images in any way we want to uh, cover different wavelength ranges to make what are called false color images. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they are using the H alpha and the O3 filters that we talked about. Uh, in theory, you can get as close to the human eye as you can by using three broadband filters that correspond to the red, the green, and the blue. Uh, but in this case, we were using the narrow band filters. All right, thanks, Amanda. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's getting kind of late and I think we've uh, pretty much done everything we were hoping to do tonight. So Zinan, anything, any parting comments? Uh, yes, uh, for all the resources and links that have been shared within this presentation, um, you could find it in the comment section below. Um, and uh, there's also the Stone Edge Observatory website on which you can find uh, Amanda's contact information if you're interested. Awesome. Okay, then I think we're going to wrap this up. We hope to see, every, see you all on September 10th at our episode number three. So... Have a good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night. <laughs>